Welcome back, Canaanites. Today we continue the story of Halo Wars 2, both the campaign and Phoenix Logs. Last time, Spirit Forces, led by Jerome, were escorting Professor Anders up to a cartographer. Today we take a break from the main story as we hook up with the namesake for our fourth mission, Alice 130. This level marks the first of what are a couple of basically filler missions, as they don't advance the plot, instead showing us what Alice gets up to before later on, meeting up once again with the rest of Red Team. So, having escaped capture and somehow surviving multiple fuel rod blasts, Alice finds herself near a water treatment structure where the Banished have set up camp and are holding a number of Spirit of Fire prisoners. While the Covenant never took prisoners, the Banished aren't the Covenant, so this was an interesting change of pace for an RTS mission. Alice frees these forces, and they make their way to a nearby abandoned UNSC outpost. There, Alice manages to contact the Spirit of Fire and report their situation. During this, we learn that Alice escaped the situation at the end of the first mission by hijacking an enemy vehicle, a ghost as revealed in the Phoenix Logs. But anyway, before Spirit Forces can send Pelicans in for rescue, more banished forces arrive, forcing Alice and those she rescued to defend themselves. Now, while this is an awesome moment in the level and a ton of fun, one thing I have to criticize is the fact you can call in turrets. Why, you ask? Well, Captain Cutter notes that Pelicans are on the way to extract Alice and other survivors. However, what, pray tell, drops in turrets? Pelicans. So you're telling me that Pelicans can't get to Alice for another several minutes, but they can quickly run in to drop a turret? Now I know this is a nitpick, and it's really just gameplay more than anything story related, but since Halo Wars 2 multiplayer has drop turrets, I feel like they could have used that animation in this level, rather than the traditional pelican delivery. I'm constantly thinking whenever I play this mission, hey, why can't that pelican evac me? Also, once the evac does come, they apparently just leave the warthog gunners behind. Guys, you forgot a few people. But anyway. Once evacuated, Alice and the surviving troopers are ordered to continue small hit-and-run operations, providing additional trouble for the banished, something Alice is more than eager to do. Like I said, filler, light on plot, but fun. There's actually a great Phoenix log that follows up on the events, too. In the days following Alice's actions, tales begin spreading among the Ungoy about Alice, even a version actually referring to her as THE Demon, aka the Master Chief. The tales result in two attempted desertions, forcing the Gerald Hanai Captain Belcaris to directly dispel the rumors saying that the deaths at the water treatment structure were the results of an accident, probably caused by Ungoy. Interesting though, when referring to Alice, the log always says, unknown translation. Not sure what that's supposed to mean, if anything, but it's interesting. But continuing on, the next mission returns to our main story as Spirit Forces attempt to access the cartographer, only to be cut off by an energy shield. So, Spirit Forces once again set up a base of operations. At Anders' direction, they target an energy node, which then allows Anders into a central chamber. From there, they have to take out three more nodes to gain entry to the map room. Once they do, Anders enters the map room, discovering that the Banished have been mapping and taking control of the Ark's portal network. Jerome and Anders are about to head back to the Spirit when a final wave of Sentinels attacks, the level coming to an end with what is probably one of the coolest in-game cutscenes in the game, though I do have to question the mechanics of this badassery since scale in an RTS is virtually non-existent. Pausing a moment though, let's briefly break away to talk about some Phoenix Logs, notably one about the Sangheili known as Orda Val Saham. Two of the Sangheili's journal entries find their way into the Phoenix Logs. The first is dated March 4th, almost four weeks before the Spirit of Fire arrives over the Ark. It gives a notable look at Orda's mindset, and by extension, the mindset of other Sangheili and the Banished. Orda knows that, with the fall of the Covenant, the loss of his religion, and his very way of life, he really only had one thing to turn to, one thing he knew, battle and conflict. Atriox gives him a purpose, one free of lies and deceit. He views Atriox as one who talks like a warrior, and for these reasons follows him. It's great insight into why Sangheili, traditionally obsessed with honor, might turn to the path of mercenaries in service of Atriox. It's a little saddening that we couldn't get this through Let Valir, a Sangheili actually present in the game, but the Phoenix Logs are a close second. The second entry of interest is dated on March 30th, which was written after the events of the 5th level. Orda relates the loss of the cartographer and notes that he will have to fall back to defend portals under Decimus's command. Orda then remembers back to when they first took the cartographer, how he saw in Decimus's eyes the same awe and reverence he once had, indicating that, while Decimus has pledged himself to Atriox, 
he may still harbor belief in the Great Journey, or at least in the Forerunners being gods. But getting back to the main story, the final level for this episode follows Jerome and Spirit Forces as they track down Decimus while halting banished access to the Ark's portal network. We open with Hornets reconning the area, though they are destroyed as we are introduced to the new Banished Reaver, a vehicle original to the Banished rather than repurposed from Covenant Tech. Jerome's forces advance, coming upon a Wraith, but the tank is hijacked by Douglas who makes a surprising and welcome return. After being crippled, nearly killed, in the opening level, this was the perfect way to bring Douglas back into the campaign. This moment would also seem to be, if I'm correct, the moment we're meant to be introduced to the upgraded version of Mark IV that all of Red Team would eventually have. To clarify, according to the January 18th issue of Cannon Fodder, the Mjolnir armor we actually see in the game, occasionally in the main menu and on the Blitzcart art, is an upgraded version of Mark IV created by taking advantage of Gen 2 components recovered from the Ark. It would seem likely that Jerome and Alice wouldn't receive upgrades until after the campaign, seeing as they likely didn't have the time. Douglas, on the other hand, would have had to get his armor repaired in order to re-enter the battlefield. So once again, I believe this moment is when, canonically, the new form of Mjolnir is meant to appear, a version that canonically has shields and likely a few other upgrades. So, with Douglas at their side, Spirit Forces advance as Decimus retreats. They take out Banished forces along the way and take control of the portal network by destroying devices the Banished had set up to control them. Eventually, Jerome, Douglas, and their forces confront Decimus for the final time. While there isn't too much to say canonically about this fight, I honestly say it's probably one of, if not the best boss fights in a Halo title. Halo has always been somewhat infamous for its boss fights, which are often considered lackluster at best by critics and many fans. Not necessarily terrible, but certainly underwhelming and tedious. Perhaps it's the RTS setting, maybe it's the music, but whatever it is, the final fight with Decimus is a ton of fun no matter how many times I replay it. The one criticism I would have against this level is that, by the time we kill Atriox's second-in-command, we still barely know him. He's probably the most present of the three advertised banished leaders in vanilla Halo Wars 2, and we barely learn anything about him in the campaign. It's far from a deal breaker, but it's something I felt I needed to point out. And that wraps up these three levels. They're a lot of fun in their own right and do the basic job of moving the story forward. Beyond that, however, there sadly isn't much to say. The next few levels, however, will dive us deeper into the UNSC banished conflict as the Spirit of Fire finally comes under attack and the crew has to come up with a way to take out the vastly superior force. There's gonna be a lot to say, so stay tuned. Until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you.